Because in order to know where we are going, we need to know where we are coming from. Do you understand? Mm. Because many people do not have a picture of where we are in history. And how does that, uh, 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 you know, fit in with the plan of God? And so we need to understand church history in order to see where we are going. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay? Uh, and so, uh, so very important. So we know, we, we've just been talking about what is happening in the book of Acts. And when Jesus spoke those words about the, um, you know, uh, the the, the uh, you know the first love that is towards the latter part of the the first century okay when he is speaking those about about the church in in in, in, um, in revelation right mm -hmm. but then we know the church continues but here by the 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 three hundreds already more and more uh, things out of Heathenism, uh, and out of the um, you know the uh, 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 heathen religions are coming into the, the the church, and then we know we shared with you the one night when uh, Constantine uh, you know uh, started those those churches in in in, in um, Constantinople, which is Istanbul today, Hagia Sophia, and and then more and more buildings were planted, built all over, all right? And how the priesthood got trapped inside, the altar got trapped inside, how the building now had to look like a palace, and how the whole model that Jesus introduced that was free and, and multiplying and, and organic and, and, and uh, you know, uh, not centralized, how that model now got ground to a halt. Yeah. And now we began to have centralized church government. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually there came a split between what, uh, what was uh, the, the Roman Empire between East and Western part of, of the Roman Empire. And there came a split in even the, the, those churches. So you had the Eastern Orthodox and then out of Rome, you had the Roman Catholic Church, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Right. And so then came the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. yeah. And do you understand that the light in the church was growing dim? Yeah. yeah. And the light in society grew dim. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. And we have the dark middle ages. Mm -hmm. And anybody who loved Jesus and wanted to walk outside of those institutions were severely persecuted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody that truly wanted to follow the Lord in a biblical manner were extremely persecuted and killed and burned at the stake. Right. By the church. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Alright? Then, understand what also happened was, was um, uh, the Word of God uh, was taken from the people. Yeah. Nobody was allowed to have any scriptures because ordinary people are... Uh, um, uneducated and cannot understand the Word of God. Yeah. Okay? So now, what starts to be taught more and more as you get deeper into the Dark Ages, because most of the, of the, the bishops and, and priests in many places throughout Europe were themselves uh, not really well educated, but they were the, the mayor, the, the, the priest, uh, the judge, I mean, they were everything. Mm -hmm. All right? They held control over towns and villages and cities. Mm. And, and that's how the, Ro that's what was called the Rome, the, the Holy Roman Empire. The, the Roman Catholic had this r rule over the whole of Western Europe. Okay? And so, so, 
and they they would these priests what they would teach the people would be fables. Yeah. Hello. The people yeah. would be what? They, they would teach the people fables oh. and all kinds of things, and so tremendous darkness came. But there were still pockets where people were getting saved and people were, were serving the Lord throughout that. But it was, you know, tremendous underground for a long time. And then was the beginning. And the reason we are doing this next year is uh, 2017. Can any of you say, tell me, what is the significance of next year? What is so significant about 2017? Sorry? Yes. Did I tell you guys? You told us. All right, oh, told you. All right. All right, so I told you guys. You guys remember. All right. It is, it is 500 years. Um, but when Martin Luther did that, the Reformation had already been going on for 200 years. Yeah, that's good. So, well, the beginning. They were yes. precursors. Yes. I'll put it this way. They were precursors to the Reformation, yeah. but the Reformation is usually, uh, you oh. know, the start of it, October 31st, 1517, when Martin Luther, you know, wrote the 95 Theses and hammered them into the door of the church at Wittenberg. Mm -hmm. So I really want to encourage you again, prepare for it. You know, this is a great time. And uh, are you familiar with the books of that Robert Leardon uh, has written? God's Generals. God's Generals. Uh, yeah, we have that. Well, well, there's several one of them here, which is actually Bob's books. But there's one called The Roaring Reformers. And that deals, tells about Martin Luther and John Calvin. But it actually even starts before that in, in, in uh, Robert Leardon's book. He starts actually with Wycliffe. Yeah. who lived in the 1300s in England, in Oxford. And uh, what do you, when, you, when you hear the name Wycliffe, what do you think of? Bible translation. Bible translation, yeah. Because a modern day society was named after him because Wycliffe translated the Bible into the English of that day. And it was really the first attempt to take the Bible out of the ancient, the classic languages. I mean, it had gone from the Greek in which it was written, it had gone into Latin. You know, several said, you know, right in the beginning, they translated it in, into Latin. But after that, it was never translated again into any of the languages that the people actually spoke. So by the Middle Ages, it was only the educated class that could even read Latin anymore. So can you see, not only was the Bible trapped inside of the monasteries and no person was allowed to have a copy, but even if they would have a, have a copy, they wouldn't have been able to read it because they weren't educated that way. Latin wasn't really a spoken language anymore, but it was a language of scholars. So that's what Wycliffe did. He wrestled the Bible out of where it was and translated it into the language of the people. And that is what he is remembered for. And um, he said this, Wycliffe had come to regard the scriptures as the only reliable guide to the truth about God and maintained that all Christians should rely on the Bible rather than on the teachings of the popes and the clerics. Oh, I mean, can you think, if we did not have the Bible, if what the Lord Jesus had given us was just transferred orally from generation to generation, where would we have been today? I mean, can you imagine, it? Can you imagine such a situation? But the Word of God is the truth, and it is God-inspired. And therefore, it should always be our anchor, and it should always be our foundation, to which we compare whatever is said and taught in, in, wow. in the church. And no leader in the church is above being compared to what the Word of God says. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise, mm -hmm. we get back into the Roman Catholic situation mm -hmm. where the where the Pope spoke the authoritative word, you know, and even today, in our 
spiritual prophetic circles. Mm. If you say something that you see in the Bible, we often get the question, well, what does this leader say? Well, does this agree with this leader? Mm. You know, really, there is an aspect of us that hold whatever leaders say in such high regard that, you know, any, any teaching or anything that you have to say has to align with what is being said in the church and being preached into the, in the church. And people then just compare it to the Word of God. But let's get back to what Wycliffe um, wrestled back, that the Word of God should really be the authority. Yes, um, Tyler? I was listening to a teaching just the other day, and this guy like blew my mind. He said, uh, he, said uh, he was talking about Jesus in, when he was tempted by the enemy. Yes. Um, he said, look at what Jesus didn't do. Jesus didn't say, I'm the Son of God, what are you doing here? But he humbled himself under the Word of God and quoted Scripture back to the enemy. Yes. And like yes. he set the example of saying, like, he put himself under Scripture and took like the form of a servant and didn't count like equality with God to be something used to his advantage. But he put himself under the Word of God. Yes, very good. Yeah. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you for sharing that. And... Uh, you know, also, if we're talking about the harvest, the Word of God must be exported out of the church again. Because that is one of the things that we have kept firmly trapped on the inside of the, of, of, of the building. And only in the hands of the professionals. They are the ones who are, you know, who are teaching the Word. Yeah. An unbeliever can still be led to the Lord on the outside, but then if he wants to be discipled in the Word, he has to come to the inside of the church. That is where the Word of God is being broken open. But we need to be equipping ordinary believers so that they can break open the Word of God and take it into the house of the newly saved person. But it must be a true Word. It must be a biblical Word. A word. I'm not talking about fables and experience. And, you know, there's so many outrageous things, this, that, and the other thing. But just come back to the simplicity and the authority yeah. of the Word of God. And, you know, what is so... In and, you know, there's much more to Wycliffe's life, I mean, uh, than I'm even beginning to do justice. That's why I say, please go and read that book. You will learn so much more mm -hmm. from him. But just something interesting about his life. Uh, he was a martyr. He died of natural causes and he was but buried. But with great opposition, tremendous opposition yes. his whole life. Yes, tremendous opposition. And then, I don't know, 15 or 20 years after his death, mm -hmm. the Roman Catholic Church issued an edict that his bones had to be exhumed, oh, yeah. burned <laughs> to ashes, and then the ashes were thrown into the River Swift. I mean, they yeah, were so sad. I mean, it Absolutely. was almost like martyring him after the fact, after he had already died and was buried. He was exhumed and treated in that way. Can you, you know, just think of the demonic opposition against the Word of God and placing the Word of God in the hands of ordinary people. I heard that a great revival broke out down river from where yeah. were those ashes. <laughs> yeah. You can't that. stop that. Oh, yeah. so. mm -hmm. Okay, then the next person that was really pre-reformer was John Huss, and he was, in, he was a Czech, and that province was called Bohemian, uh, Bohemia. And uh, he also did many things. He actually, it was actually students from the Czech Republic that went to Oxford, where Wycliffe was. And they brought Wycliffe's teachings back to pray, Prague. And uh, at a time, and soon after that, all of uh, Wycliffe's teachings and writings was ordered to be burnt. So uh, the only churches. few copies that actually survived went to Prague and, um, and really inspired the reformers there. And John Huss became a leader there. And he also did many things. I cannot uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, advise you strong enough, get that book. You can order it off Amazon. You know, sometimes this book, you can pick them up second hand and they're as, as good as new and you can get them like for three and four dollars off Amazon. You know, so look for that as well. And uh, John Haas, again, uh, one of the great things that he did was to allow ordinary people to partake in the Lord's table. Because at that time, the Lord's table was deemed so holy, holy that the ordinary people could only look at the priests partaking of the elements. Wow. Yes, it was just a visual thing. You could just look at it. That was the Lord's table, but it was deemed too holy for ordinary people to partake in. And he said, no, the ordinary people needed to partake at the Lord's table. You know, we take the Lord's table so for granted. At least that is one thing that is often celebrated and partaken of in homes. Who of you have done that in your house? And who of you do it quite regularly in your own home? You know what the price was for us, even to let ordinary people partake of it sitting in a church building? It could do. He was burnt at the stake. And, you know, just again, let us, let us value the things, the holy things of God that has been passed on to us and that has been restored because people paid for their lives for these things. Mm -hmm. And let us not be neglectful mm -hmm. as we're talking about going into the harvest concerning these things. A price has been paid. And let me just say this about us that is so important. Us had such a revelation of Jesus and such a decision that he took to take a stand for Jesus. And the Pope of that day was a tremendously evil man. That, you know, uh, I mean, affairs with women, uh, I mean, all kinds of money issues. I mean, just you name every every evil and the Pope was involved in it. You understand? He spoke against it and and they required of him to recount all of this. And he said, I have to obey Jesus. And I have to stand with Jesus. No matter what it costs me. I have to please Jesus. Some of the people that in years earlier was close friends of him had flipped and turned against him. People that was his confidence had turned against him. But he would not turn. But he would face the, the stake to, for the sake of Jesus and for the sake of people having the opportunity to have communion and have a revelation of Jesus. And in the churches that he was involved with, they preached the gospel, which was not being preached in, in any churches. You understand that? He preached the gospel. People actually got saved under his ministry during that time. And when he was, was um, burnt at the stake, a whole movement arose of people that resisted the Roman Catholic Church that would not submit and continued the work that he had started. Okay, so just to recap, so Wycliffe lived in the 1300s and then John Huss was uh, burnt at the stake in 1415. So then in 1517, which is about a hundred years after uh, Huss was martyred. Mm -hmm. That is when uh, Luther, and Luther was influenced by the writings of Huss. Mm -hmm. Because by 1517, we know about the 95 Theses, which we have already spoken about. But even before that, Luther himself had become saved. He had discovered that we are saved by grace through faith. You've got to believe in the Lord Jesus instead of the works-based and especially the indulgence-based salvation that was being sold in the Catholic Church of that day. So, and many of his 95 theses had to do with salvation and the whole concept of purgatory 
and uh, you know, buying indulgences from the church. Tremendous history there. So, so that then really is what we talk about the Reformation, that would be from Luther onward. And you know, Luther, who of you can name some of the other reformers at that time? No, he came much later and he was, he was, he was in, 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 in the US. Zinzendorf, also a little later, I think. Yes. Um, but who else? No, 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 Was he at that time? Yes. Yeah, yeah, he was the, wasn't he the guy that actually... Helped Luther? Uh, helped Luther. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Okay, but other of the big names of the Reformation? Calvin. Calvin, Calvin. yes. Yes. So are you talking about across... John Calvin? Are you talking about across the span from then until now? No, 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 no. no. In, that time, time. in that period. Okay. The beginning of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. Luther, Calvin, and there's another Erasmus. person. Erasmus was there, yes, and he was yes. a reformer specifically concerning the Word of God. Yes. 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 Great. Okay, Erasmus, and who else? Have you ever heard of Zwingli? Oh, yeah, John Zwingli. Okay, yes. Actually, Ulrich uh, uh, Zwingli. John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli. Okay, Calvin, again, go and read the book, find out more about him. Now, I just want to say this about what happened in the time of Zwingli. Actually, ideas, Zwingli was in Zurich, in Switzerland, mm -hmm. and ideas about the Reformation and the new move of God kind of came to him independently from the others. He didn't learn these things from, from Luther, but, you know, God was beginning to do something there under his leadership in his church, but of course, you know, soon this everybody, is in everybody knew about one another, and, you know, a lot of cross-pollination was taking place. But as uh, Zwingli started preaching quite a radical message himself. But there was a group of his followers under the leading of Felix Matz. And they too, because the Reformation was also greatly promoted by the printing of the Bible. You know, first of all, the Bible had to be translated, but it was really the Gutenberg printing press mm -hmm. that put the Bible into the hands of the people because you had to make many copies. So people were discovering the Word of God for themselves. So Felix Munz and his group started reading in the Bible and came to the conclusion... In a house church. Yes, in a house <laughs> church. <laughs> <laughs> that it's only that you have to be a believer in the Lord Jesus. You have to be saved before you can get baptized. Which was, of course, completely the opposite of the practice of the day and had been that way for many centuries. Including you know, many of the reformers still continued the, the, the infant baptism, all right? Yes, for yeah. over a thousand years. It was here by the year, you know, 300 that that infant sprinkling was the common practice. So for over a thousand years, this practice of infant sprinkling was in the church. Mm. And these were the first people here at the time of the Reformation that came to the conclusion that it's believers that needed to be baptized. When was it the Gutenberg Press? The Gutenberg Press is round about in the 1400s, like I think 1465. I'm not quite sure. You know, just check it out, but that he started printing Bibles. So, uh, so they came to the conclusion of believers' baptism and a tremendous tension. And Zwingli, who was, you know, their leader, was very opposed to this idea. And um, uh, let me just read this to you. Let me just the execution of Felix Marx. Let me just say this, and what they had done, because, you see, for so long, city government and the church was one. The church governed the city. Yeah, and the city governed the church. And the city governed, the, you understand, so the two were intermingled so much. So Zwingli met together with the city council. You understand? This is how these things worked in those days. Okay, so let's just read this. On March 7, 1526, okay, so Luther was 1517, so this is like nine years after that event, the Zurich Council 
passed an edict that made adult reed baptism punishable by drowning. What? On 5 mm. January 1527, months became the first casualty of the edict, and the Swiss, and the first Swiss Anabaptist to be martyred at the hands of other Protestants. While Munz stated that he wished to bring together those who were willing to accept Christ, obey the word, and follow in his footsteps to unite with these by baptism, and to purchase the rest in their present conviction. Zwingli and the council accused him of obstinately refusing to recede from his error and caprice. At 3 p.m. he was led from the Wellenberg to a boat. He praised God and preached to the people. A reformed minister went along, seeking to silence him and hoping to give him an opportunity to recant. Munz's brother and mother encouraged him to stand firm and suffer for Jesus' son. Wow. It is said that the night before he was executed, before he was drowned in the river, his mother wrote him a note and sent it to prison, telling him to stand firm in his conviction wow. and not to oh, recant. Wow. You know, I, this story, I just always find it so moving. I want to be that kind of mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to be that kind of person. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was, okay, to suffer for Jesus' sake. He was taken by boat into the river Lamat. His hands were bound and pulled behind his knees, and a pole was placed between them. He was executed by drowning in Lake Zurich on the Lamat. His alleged last words were, Into thy hands, O God, I commend my spirit. His property was confiscated by the government of Zurich and he was buried at St. Jacob's Cemetery. Munzer's execution predates, okay, then they talk about some further events during the time of the Reformation. But again, the price for baptism, and we just take it so for granted today, and even so neglected, you know, we do not even take it seriously. When we lead somebody to the Lord, are you already thinking about baptism for that person and what it will mean? You know, many years ago or several years ago, uh, the Lord challenged me. You know, we all have a picture of revival in our heads. And when I think of revival, it's probably the, the usual picture. We see large crowds, we see stadiums filled, we see great miracles, we see him preaching night after night, and we think of large crowds of people coming, and the lost flocking to these events, and many people getting saved. Who of you have got that kind of picture? And it kind of is all happening automatically, you know, with not a lot of effort, you know, the people are just coming. So I was thinking of that, and the Lord asked me this. Why doesn't your picture of revival include baptism? And challenged me, when you think of large groups of people getting saved, you should be thinking of large groups of people moving through the waters of baptism. Mm -hmm. You know, and ever since that time, um, it became such a passion in my heart and such a part of our ministry to want to see people getting baptized. And we will teach more upon that tomorrow evening.